I get Walter Davis is discussing the the way he dealt with the death of his pioneer partner Bill Cornick and now he's married and his wife Carol has also become a pioneer with him what they're trying to do at least Walter is trying to do is bury his doubts that have been there even before Bill was killed in the car accident and the resultant blood transfusion refusal the doubts were already piling up and had been piling up now for a couple of years. And he goes on, during this same period of time, I happened to call at the home of the pastor of the San Bernardino Community Church. He invited me in and we discussed the Trinity and the deity of Jesus Christ. He shared with me his moving testimony of having been saved by personal faith in Jesus Christ from a life of drunkenness. Christ had cleaned up his life, sustained him in his studies at Biola College, and after graduation had called him into the ministry. As a gospel minister, he was earning much less than he had formerly earned as a businessman. He said the society's indictment of clergymen as being money-hungry might apply to some liberal modernist churchmen who preached the social gospel, but it did not apply to the average struggling pastor of an evangelical fundamentalist church who truly preached the gospel. We discussed at length his criticisms of the renderings of the Greek in the New World Translation of the Society. I recall how uncomfortable I became as I listened to this dedicated Christian pastor refute every point I made in trying to defend the Society's mistranslations. As I look back now, I can see how ridiculous, if not humorous, I must have appeared to this pastor as I argued with him about Hebrew and Greek. I was totally ignorant of these languages and of the disciplines of exegesis and hermeneutics. This kind Christian man never ridiculed me, but lovingly, yet firmly, showed me that if the witnesses insisted on the New World Translation of John 1.1 1, 1 and other texts, then we were polytheists and should not call ourselves Christians. Up until this time, except for the policy on blood transfusions, I had never seriously questioned the New World Translation and the Society's doctrines. He gave me Dr. Bruce M. Metzger's pamphlet, The Jehovah's Witnesses and Jesus Christ, for further study on the doctrines we had discussed. Reading this pamphlet and thinking of my frequent experiences with saved, born-again Christians motivated me to begin to study the Bible more seriously. Until now, most of my Bible reading had been done in conjunction with studying Watchtower literature. Now I began to study and meditate prayerfully on the scriptures themselves. I cautiously shared with Carol some of the experiences I was having with Christians I had met. In her zeal as a newly baptized witness, she dismissed them as religionists who were completely wrong, but I could no longer dismiss them so lightly. After I stopped pioneering, I remained active in the field ministry, but my heart was no longer in it. I continued to attend the meetings and to give talks, but I was losing my zeal at the very time my future wife was becoming increasingly more zealous. My whole life was centered around the society. I had always tried to be a good, faithful Jehovah's Witness. I had made mistakes and had sinned, but I had always remained theocratic in my allegiance. Doubts about the society's teachings and practices bothered me, and I knew that I couldn't continue indefinitely in this mental state. I did not want to leave the society, but I did decide that at all costs I was going to let God be true in my life. And here he cites Romans 3, verses 3 and 4. Let God be true was one of the study books that they were using back in the 40s and 50s. I reasoned that if our faith as witnesses was true and based on the Bible, then honest and critical re research and searching wouldn't disprove it. As a pioneer, I had challenged hundreds of people to put their religion to the test. In the foreword to Make Sure of All Things, on page 5, the Society encouraged us to study the highest authority, as they put it, the Holy Bible, Jehovah's Word. Now, after having associated with the Society for four years, I was going to put it to the test of God's Word. The same publication stated, quote, but Jehovah's advice goes even further. The book of highest authority does not ask us to accept just one statement of truth, and that blindly, but rather God's prophet says, Come now, let us reason together, saith Jehovah. End of quote. This is what I resolved to do. 
I had been wrong before in my Mormon religion, had I been misled and deceived a second time by the Watchtower Society. One day I went into the Bible bookstore in San Bernardino and there met Pastor Robert Purcell, an ordained Southern Baptist minister. We struck up a conversation on the scriptures and I soon introduced myself as a Jehovah's Witness who was sincerely searching for the truth of God's word. Again, I was to hear that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. This time, I didn't argue, but said that if I were wrong in my religion and Jesus were the truth, then I wanted him. I refused to surrender my life to Jesus then because I first wanted to get straight doctrinally. Bob encouraged me to purchase the book Jehovah of the Watchtower by Walter R. Martin and Norman H. Klan. It was an expose of the history, doctrines, and anti-biblical teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I began to study it carefully along with the Bible. This book was used of God to open my eyes to the pseudo-scholarship of the society. I had thought previously that its men were the greatest biblical scholars in the world. Now, whenever I had questions that I wanted more information on, I would ask both the mature brothers in my congregation and the Reverend Bob Purcell. The conflicting answers I received from them only drove me to the Bible that much more. Throughout this time of searching, I had the faith that Jehovah would lead me out of my perplexity and into the real truth. Carol and I were married in the Colton Kingdom Hall on December 28, 1957. John Stippich, my personal friend and former Bethelite, performed the ceremony. He had once told me that the, our society's president, Nathan Homer Knorr, had it made if any man ever did. He lived in a penthouse luxury compared to the others at Bethel. Let me read that again. He lived in penthouse luxury compared to others at Bethel. According to John, that is this man who married him, John, according to John, Nora had only the finest and best of everything and anything he wanted. John told me there were things he had learned and seen back at Bethel that would shake the faith of the average brother in the society if he knew about them. He would never tell me what these were other than to say that the directors of the society lived much better than the other brothers there. I recall his telling me once that while he was at Bethel, one of the brothers, one of Nor's favorites, had run away from Bethel and joined up with Billy Graham after writing Nor a letter in which he denounced the society. Still more to come in the, the testimony of Walter Davis. In this story, uh, it's now turned a page. He, is, he, Walter, is full of doubts, and his wife, Carol, who is a new convert to the Watchtower Society, is more zealous than he is. So next time we'll see how she responds when his, his stance becomes more clear to her and what she tries to do about it. I'll put in a link to the first of our Bill Setnar playlist. It's not just Bill, though. It's Bill and Joan Setnar that are testifying about their life experience at New York Bethel in the 1950s. And it does correspond, unfortunately, with what John Stippich reports to Walter here. <clears throat> Ironically, when he's marrying Carol. So I'll put in the link to the first of the Setnar playlist and also to the playlist itself. See you soon.